This is the Money Seed Podcast, where we discuss all things investing, plain and simple, the way it should be. Please remember, this show is for educational and entertainment purposes only and is not intended to be investment advice. Welcome back to the Money Seed Podcast. I am thrilled to have Victor Bell of Bell Capital. Victor is a very successful real estate investor. He has been investing in real estate since the mid-90s. Victor has been involved in close to $60 million worth of real estate deals over the past 25 years. Victor, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks a lot for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm happy to be here. And if that wasn't enough, Victor is also an accomplished author. I think you've been a number one Amazon uh, bestselling mm-hmm. author on several books. Um, and you also have several business courses online, et cetera. And we'll get into all that, Victor. Uh, but first, I want to start with how you got into real estate. Tell us about the very first deal and what what made the light bulb go off and say, you know what? Uh, there, there's a long-term play here in real estate. I can, I can do this. I can do this forever. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I actually started off, I got out of the military. So I'll shrink my story down a little bit and get to the real estate piece. So I got out of the military. Um, went to college on the free money. Um, and they said, if you come back, you're going to owe us money. Um, I did, I did <laughs> so, you know, like the military free stuff. And then, um, I actually got in, got myself into some trouble and I had to get a job. So while I was on that job, I was started realizing like, wow, no one likes their job. People have been there for 10 years, hated it. And I was brand new and other people were kind of new and they also hated their job. So I knew that that wasn't where I wanted to be after leaving the military, not, you know, staying in college for more than a full semester. Um, one night I was driving home and I fell asleep um, and ended up kind of in the grass. I'm, you know, I'm from Texas originally. And uh, I was like, all right, I, I got to do something different. So I actually drove back to Austin and uh, started going to a bookstore. And I would just go to the bookstore every day. And I was kind of looking at all the business books. And I was like, there's something here that I can do. And I got a book. It was Fast Cash with Ron Grand. Fast Cash with Real Estate were on the grand. And I bought that book and I actually read it for about two weeks until I got my check. And then uh, I brought it to where I worked and literally grabbed the new, I mean, this was, you know, back in the nineties, grabbed the newspaper and used the phone there and just really just kind of read the script in the book and called out, you know, called a few people in the newspaper. And that first year I did $1.2 million worth of deals. Um, I, I did not know what I was doing. <laughs> but, hey, Victor, uh, Victor, sorry. Let, let me stop you right there. So when you said you started calling people, were you looking for yes. uh, like pre, a pre-foreclosure or what uh, What kind of properties were you looking at? Really, there were single family houses. Like there was just any person that was for sale by owner in the newspaper. Got it. So you, you were looking for a for sale by owner. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Okay. So um, I didn't really know the difference between a multifamily or single family house or anything. It was just like call somebody that's a motivated seller typically in a newspaper and and read this script, which was in the book. Um, And so I happened to call someone who was like, yeah, sure. You know what? Uh, I'm willing to sell. You know, back then it was like, is that the least amount you could take for your house? Which is probably the same script that's out there nowadays. But, um, and he's like, yeah, sure. Come down to my shop, guy owned a gas station. So in the, so then I panicked. I don't know if anybody else's, I didn't, I didn't have this background, had no, fall back. So I was like, oh my gosh, like now I owe this guy money. (laughs) So, (laughs) so um, the book also was like, Hey, you know, looking in in the phone book and call like mortgage companies and all this other stuff and talk to them and see if they can partner with you call to see if they have an REO department. It was a bunch of different information that was in this book. So I ended up cold calling out of the phone book, which was Austin of the big yellow pages that, you know, it's two big ones, um, all of the mortgage companies and, and all that stuff then. And I finally got from the A's to the S's before somebody actually took my call. And um, it was Success it was Success Investments. That was the name of the company. And uh, I talked to Bob. And Bob was like, you don't know what you're doing, do you? And I was like, I don't. All I know is that I have a potential opportunity. I don't know what to do. And he was like, how'd you get this number? I told him. I cold called. And he was like, I wish I had an office full of you guys. And he was like, come on in. And um, he actually introduced me to uh, my first business partner, and then he became a partner in those deals. And uh, that's how I kind of pulled the trigger on that. So I raised the money, like everyone said, but I didn't know that. I didn't understand market cycles. There was none of that. There was just me looking at my life and saying, okay, I need to do something. And I got that book and that was pretty simple. Find a deal, negotiate the deal, you know, and find the money you can make it. 
and and that's Victor, how that started. Hmm? Yeah, and uh, so what was your plan with that house, right? So you, you you meet this guy at the gas station, you agreed to buy his house. What was your plan with the house? Uh, sell it, <laughs> sell it, so and just kind it. of flip it a little bit, like just get into it and then flip it. Yeah, yeah, because I didn't know. So like back then, there was no like flip or anything like that. It was just like you know, then I think it was it was called assignment, assignment of contract. But that's what the book said that we can do. So, but you know, Bob, you know, which later became my partner, Bob and Jamie, they own the company. They were like, go back and ask him. Does he have any more properties? Um, and sure enough, and he's like, yeah, I got 300 properties. And I was like, you know, Bob was like, ask him, would he, would he sell some more? And I was like, would you sell anything else? And he was like, yeah, I think I can put together something for you. And that's how I ended up getting all those deals that first year. Literally, it was just, you know, so to your point, my thought was, okay, great. I got this one house. I could probably pick it up for, you know, 15 grand. It would give it to me for like super cheap. And that turned into multifamily, which was the next piece was inside of all of the deals that he's, there were fourplexes, duplexes, triplex, eight unit, a 12 unit. Uh, like, like there were all these little packages of properties that went along with this single family home. So that's how I really got into there. And that was my lesson. The single family house out of that, all of the rest of the deals that I got was probably the worst of the portfolio, which that one had the most headaches. You know, we, we did fix it up and that was the first thing to go. Um, and then we had everything else for a while. So that's how I got into this. And it it sounds like fairy tale-ish, but I work really hard because I I think on the premise that during that time I hadn't went to any seminars. I literally was operating out of a book and relying on hey, going to, you know, Bob and Jamie's office, which they weren't in real estate, they were a mortgage company. So I actually learned by because he was like, hey, just come in every day. And he actually worked for Ron Legrand running around selling seminars and, and all that other stuff, how to structure creative financing, buying notes, selling them on the back end, like back that back then, right? Um, so I happened to just go in and sit around and just listen. And then he was like, hey, why don't you come to a seminar and help sell stuff in the back of the room? And I was like, okay, you know, sure. <laughs> so, so I got an opportunity to meet a lot of people that were doing this business the seminar way, but I was in the real world of actually doing the business. So I was having to take what I heard, what I learned and actually apply it. So that actually got me into the multifamily as I went because I, I did a lot of residential as well because, you know, I've been doing this full time since then. I haven't had a job other than back in that time I had to keep a job because I was got in trouble and then that went away. So this has been how I've taken care of my family. So, you know, as an investor, raising money, investing, you know, buying close, buying other deals, partnering with people like this has been the constitution of everything that I've done. So yeah. that's that's actually that's a great story. So basically from your first deal, you start cold calling, trying to find money, right? To, to close the deal. And as luck would have it, you meet up with a team that actually kind of brought you on board and and uh, worked with you. That's 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 awesome. Right, yeah. And you know, into that story now, as a matter of fact, Jamie, she was one of the partners. Um, she actually is my investor relations uh, manager for Bell Capital. So, she, you know, to, to go from that for them being, you know, really my mentors to now working with my company, all these years is, you know, for me, that's been a blessing, right? It really has. And, and Victor, how did you overcome that hurdle where let's say if you are in that first year, when you're trying mm -hmm. to acquire, let's say, like you mentioned, a duplex or a fourplex or an eightplex, right? Mm -hmm. um, how did you get over that hurdle where, for example, whether it's, whether it's a mortgage company or a private lender or a bank, they say, okay, you know, what's your income? You know, how, how can you carry this property if you have a bit of vacancy or one of your tenants falls behind in rent? How did you overcome that, that financing challenge? In my beginning, I got partners because, you know, at some point, you know, real estate's only really made up whether you're doing big deals like the stuff that we look at now that's 30 to $40 million, or you're looking at a $250,000 duplex in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's the deal and the debt or the money, and that's it. Or really, it's three parts, right? The deal, the debt, and the equity. Um, so at some point, if you have somebody who can supply all the other stuff and they don't have time, like, you know, we talk about people who need to invest. If you make wealth a duty, then you say, you know, which is what I do. I was like, look, I need to make this work. It's my duty to succeed at this. So if I have to find a partner, give away 50% of the profit, do 100% of the work so I'm educated, um, that's going to stockpile over time if I do good work. And people will also open the door. They'll start to look for me as opposed to me looking for them all the time. So I treated it like a business. And truth be told, I didn't have a fallback. Yeah. So unlike, you know, some people who are kind of, 
which is the right thing to do. If you have a career and you're investing, then you should probably invest with somebody who that's what they do full time. They're not dabblers, um, you know, or if you're sitting on the other side of the fence, you know, I wouldn't suggest anyone start like I did. But I mean, if you have to start there, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of commitment. Um, and it's a lot of keeping it, it really turns into keeping your word. So to answer your question, there was no fallback. No one really asked about my wherewithal to, hey, how are you going to the loans? Because I kind of entered the space saying, hey, I don't have the background. I don't have the education. Um, you know, I, I'm working this job, but I'm probably not going to be there long because I want to make this my full time. And if you will partner with me, I will do 100% of the work, find all the deals. I'll do all the management. I'll oversee it. And I'll show up and, and be an open book to learn, which is what I did. Um, you know, I was 23, 24 years old. I was still a young guy, um, you know, so, so yeah. And so Victor, when you see one of these multifamily uh, deals, right? That I imagine these deals come across your desk all the time. Now you've been doing this for a few decades. Um, what is your typical outlook? I mean, do you look for cash flow? How many years do you plan to stay in the property property before you, you sell it or refinance it? And how, how do you analyze it? I mean, maybe a quick overview of how do you tell a good deal apart from an okay deal? Sure, sure. So the first thing I look at always is location. So, you know, as of late, you know, we, we moved to San Diego about four years ago now, four years this December. Um, and even in Hawaii, the multifamily apartment buildings that we had there was a location place. So it's like this location cannot be replaced. You know, we know that property is going to make money there. People want to live in that area. So that's typical for my underwriting. It doesn't matter about the numbers or anything. First thing is like, where is it? Um, once I believe the location is good, then I will look at the amount of units that it has because, you know, now that I'm doing more and I'm investing, I got a fund, you know, that matters because now we're about diversification. Like, you know, if we, you know, we're 10% vacant on a property, we need to make sure that this thing is still going to cover, um, whatever, no matter whether the vacancies around the country are at, you know, three and five, you know, <laughs> we need to plan for long term. So once I know the location is good, we know that there's enough units there that we can kind of hedge ourselves from anything going wrong over a 10 year play, which most multifamily debt is typically, you know, three, five, seven, 10 years, um, things like that. I just look at like, hey, if right now for, for where I am in my life, the company that we're building is a long company. So, you know, and I'm sure you probably interview people with that. Typically with multifamily people, they're usually long term investors. So I underwrite everything. Like if we have to be in this thing for 10 years or longer, do we want it? Right. So that's that's key. So I hope that answers your question because it's like a mm -hmm. super loaded, like how do you underwrite it? It's like, well, we can go with the numbers first, but if we hate the location and I don't want to keep it for 10 years because I've went through a lot of full cycles on assets and, you know, you got to want it um, regardless of what the numbers are like, you know, so. Absolutely. And Victor, you recently had an article in the Times of San Diego, and the article talked about how you believe that quality deals are going to dry up for individual investors, right, over the next mm -hmm. five, 10 years. Um, maybe, maybe give us your outlook on the, on the real estate market over the next five or 10 years. Sure, sure. So, you know, um, the real estate market itself, the rental market, I believe, is going to continue. I think it's going to flatten out a little bit over this next year, and then it's going to spike up again somewhere around mid-2024, and it's going to continue to go. Um, never in my lifetime did I think rents will be where they are today, you know, on stuff that people are paying for. And I'm like, wow, people are paying a lot of money for rent for that. Um, and, you know, it's indicative to the market that you're in. We're in California. I was in Hawaii before for 17 years playing this game. Um, but I'm also from Texas and I've done it in a bunch of other states. So the reason why I think that it's going to dry up for a lot of individual investors and they're going to have to deal with syndicators and fund managers over time is because it's more popular right now for people to pull their money together and invest with someone else who knows what they're doing. So I think if you're just an individual investor and you're not gonna do that, you're gonna say, I'm gonna go and buy my own 40 unit apartment building. Um, I think those opportunities, excuse me, are gonna be a lot less because the last three years where the money was cheap, those deals got bought up or they got refinanced, fixed up and then refinanced again. And now those people are now in debt that they can wait another five, you know, seven, 10 years before they need to refinance and come to market. So that's gone. Um, once you hit 80 units, 100 units, that tends to be a group of people. So that's why I'm always like, if you're just waiting for the perfect opportunity for a low hanging fruit come around, that may not come around as quickly as you would like. More people can start their own syndication and fund now. It's become more cost effective. 
Um, the more people who do it, the less people who will be able to, because I think it's going to become regulated over time. People get sued. People are going to lose their money, not do it right because they're new. And I think the people who didn't do it right, it's going to scare a lot of the other people off. So I think all that's really going to affect the actual investment opportunities for people who aren't, who are going to wait. I'm going to do it myself or I'm going to invest with this guy. And then that opportunity will drive to, it'll be guys like myself who are like, you know what? We're going to launch. We're going to do it now. And um, we will have figured it out over time. We'll get the deals that are going to come available. And for the people who are like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to partner. I just kind of want to do it myself and um, invest alone. I, I think it's going to get a little harder over the next five years to do that. And I think even at a high level, I, I would tend to agree. If, if only because real estate is becoming much more popular, right? As an investment thing. I mean, you talk to somebody five, 10 years ago, real estate was not as popular as it is today, right? Um, yeah. Thanks to, uh, you know, media platforms like YouTube, right? Like yeah. what we're watching this on right now. Um, just a lot of people are aware of the fact that real estate can generate really good returns, right? If you do real estate correctly, even if it's single family, um, and especially if you do multifamily, you can get returns that are typically better than the seven or 8% you're going to get in the market over the long term. So I think a lot of people are cluing into that. And so there's definitely a flood of investors into, into real estate in general. Um, but let me, let me get back to a little bit about, uh, kind of the, the changing market, right? Cause up to this point over the last five, 10 years has been a really like a big boom cycle for real estate rates were low. Um, a lot of people are flooding in populations growing, et cetera. Demand for real, for rent is up. Unemployment was low, et cetera. If we're heading into a period where rates are higher and maybe unemployment is going to kick up a little bit, and we're getting to that strange situation where say, um, cap rates are, are, are actually less than the money that you're, that people are borrowing money at, right? Like the interest rates are maybe a little bit higher than cap rates. Right. What, what kind of returns do you think multifamily can, can generate in that kind of environment? Uh, I think the returns are going to lower quite a bit. Um, but I don't think that's going to stop people from investing and buying. The reason why is because it depends on the size of deals you're we're talking about. So like, you know, when you're talking about deals that are more group size, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, well, the San Diego. So the KKR, you know, the, the, the equity residential Blackstone, the bigger companies, like at some point they have those assets and they're going to liquidate those assets because it's a part of their portfolio as rates go up and they're looking to exit the market. There's a smaller buyer pool. So now it's a rate driven sale based on the debt, not an actual sale based on the seller. Right. So, so the price points will come down and they'll be accessible. That is going to kind of pinpoint like, okay, the rate is 6.75 on the debt and the cap rate used to be four. They'll adjust a little bit to kind of get it off their books because, you know, that, that, that affects their investor returns. Um, and if they have to get rid of it, they have to. So, um, that's going to probably be more of the play. I've been talking about that a lot more as people start to write down their portfolio because of, you know, fair market value and those assessments that need to happen. They're just going to take a look at a spreadsheet and go get rid of all these. And I'm seeing that now. Um, so I think that's going to play more of a role. And I hope that answers the question. And, I, and I'm trying not to go like way off of the Richter because I get excited about this. It's kind of like my thing. Um, I just feel like that's really going to happen. So it will affect investors who are like, you know, we got to get a, you know, the rate right now is 6.75 and we got to get a 6.75. Like, well, you're not going to find a B plus asset in an irreplaceable location. Um, at a 6.5 cap, you know, mm -hmm. unless you have, you're in a fund, you have a bunch of dry powder and you're a player and you can stroke a check and say, you know what, we want it. And here's where we are. And everyone has confidence in you. So that, that's the real next play. So um, that's, how, that's, you know, to answer your question, that's how investors are going to actually get those returns that they're still getting. And in those situations, those assets are still going to trade at a 4, 4.6 4.5. I just looked at one that just traded in December after all the things that were happening that's here, that's still traded at a 4.6. And, you know, that was a, uh, I'm not going to say the name of the group, but that was a pretty big group mm -hmm. um, that liquidated. But, you know, I, I thought it was going to come in at 71 million and it did. And, you know, six months earlier, I think they came to market probably 80. Wow. Okay. Wow, so that, that's yeah. happening. But if you're not in, if you're not in the fund space or syndication space, you don't even know, right? Which is, which is, you know, hence the article. I was like, you're kind of going to get left, get the leftovers because there's this game where you can make those adjustments and buy better, buy cheaper. You know, you're going to play that cap rate game. It'll still be a lower cap rate, 
But the money is so much bigger that, you know, the the exit on those deals in the future for a smaller investor to get involved, it's going to be astronomical. Um, but, you know, if no one calls guys like me and you to let us know those things are happening, um, we'll never know. And that's that's the part I'm trying to adjust for on my fund. Makes sense. And Victor, given the the economy and the demographics, et cetera, um, where do you see what part of the U.S. do you see as as being better than others for real estate over the next? I mean, I think you're you're active in in maybe seven or eight different states at least, if yeah. not more. Um, yeah. Which part of the country do you, do you like at the moment? <laughs> I'm biased. I, I I like California. I like the West Coast. I like San Diego a lot of, and just because San Diego actually. So I I played. I got my battle scars in Hawaii. The Hawaii real estate market is crazy right like like it really is um so but hawaii's market retrofits right into san diego and i'll share this hopefully your listeners you know appreciate it so the west coast you know we'll just use it because it's a money show um i like to look at like if you have all your money your capital and you spread it out across and that's where you made your money on the west coast you park it in florida north carolina georgia which everyone's done that every market cycle everyone makes money they dump their money there when the market comes back, they exit those markets, they pull all their money out and they go back where they were. It's kind of like in battle when you send your forces out, you leave your castle unattended at some point, start getting low, you draw your, you know, or if not, your castle back where you were gets sacked. Um, that's what I feel like is going to happen, which is why I was like, okay, the West Coast, a lot of money came from the West Coast. It pumped up this area. A lot of money came from New York. It pumped up, you know, the, the Southeast. That's going to retract, which it always does. So I believe that California is 10 years behind Hawaii, and I believe California is probably 10 years behind Miami because all of that stuff is going to just retract. People are going to put money here. People are going to say it's too expensive. There's no deals, but there are a lot of deals here, a lot of deals, but you can't see it if you're just in the news. you got to be boots on the ground. So I'm very bullish on the West Coast, San Diego specifically, not so much LA and the other counties I've, I've looked around. Uh, Vegas. I've checked out Vegas. I think Vegas has a, has a collection issue. Um, I looked at four big assets there, um, you know, and they were all running around 78%, you know, economic, you know, um, occupancy, but they were full, <laughs> which means there's a collection issue, which is indicative mm -hmm. of like, Hey, there's a challenge is coming up and people are going to, the money is going to exit those deals because they're, they're on, they're, they're coming up. So I think start watching where people leave. You know, when when the, before it all took off and everyone was going to a bunch of places and stuff like that, because I've done that, too. That's why I've been investing in a lot of different places. But I tell all my investors, I didn't really start making real money until I just stuck with the high price markets. I understood the cap rates. I understood the investment strategies of the people who are actually making money there because they aren't they aren't on podcasts telling me what they did. <laughs> mm hmm. Yeah. So it's it's those guys like, how are you making money on a four cap or a 3.75 cap in a market that's so tight? Then they're like, oh, here's how. And they pull out a napkin and they show and you're like, oh, it's backwards from what we're taught. Right. They're not playing the I mean, you're investors, right? You got to pay your cash flow, your investors and it pays your debt. But they're playing the appreciation game. And at no, there's no other markets where you can say, well, look, you know what? In three years, we're going to refinance or ex exit our assets. And we'll be five, six million dollars up based yeah. on, you know, um, arbing the rent. So it's it's an interesting bird. I hope that answers that. I like, I, like it. I apologize. I, I <laughs> can get off track. So no, for sure. Yeah. And so, Victor, um, I believe that uh, right now, if, if somebody wants to invest with you, um, they can contact mm -hmm. you through Bell Capital. I believe right now you're only taking accredited investors on board, correct? Yes, it's accredited only investors um, right now. So, um, you know, and later my goal is to set up a reggae fund where we can have accredited and non-accredited investors. Again, it goes back to my theory of as things change, I want to make sure that we've already, you know, worked out all the things that we needed to as it relates to SEC requirements and compliances and put together the right teams. But for now, it's accredited only. Yeah. And what is the minimum investment that you're looking for? The minimum for us is 100000 just because, like, yeah, the size of the deals that we're looking at. But the average investor that's come on board so far is anywhere between three to 400,000. That's our average. And our minimum in is 100. Nice. And when you bring someone along with that kind of money, uh, obviously those individuals are usually already fairly well off or they're already have found some level of financial success in their life. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. What kind of, uh, what kind of returns? I mean, obviously you can't promise returns, but what no, kind of returns no. are you targeting? 
So we give our investors an 80, we do an 80, 20 split on our fund. So 80% to the investors and a 20% to us as the GPs. So that's the returns that we, and we target a 15% internal rate mm-hmm. of return with a 2%, you know, two times the equity multiple. Um, we actually are one of the few, we don't have a prep return. And it's funny, it was counterintuitive because everyone I talked to in the beginning, they're like, oh, you know, we got it because we were initially at four for the type of deals we're looking at. And some of our investors, this was, you know, before this was a couple years back, you know, when we were initially talking about doing this. Um, they're like, no, we got to get eight. We got to get 12. And I know a lot of my buddies who are syndicators who are like noosed around their neck. They can barely pay returns out. And they were, they weren't making, they, they were struggling. And whenever I did deals with any of my investors, non-fund related prior to me setting up a fund, I was like, Hey, you know what? I want to make you as much money as I can, but I can't do that if, you know, we're, we're struggling over here to just keep the lights on because then I'm going to have to do another deal. Do you, you know, you get, you know, so it needs to be a partnership. So we did that. So we amended our fund. We took away the prep return and we felt like we were finally equally yoked. And when I explained that to my investors and show them, they're like, oh, wow, this makes more sense. Right. And only the other way makes sense because it's been something that's just been accepted. And now we're like, hey, we're going to do fund after fund after fund, simple 80 to 20 split. After all reserves, debt's done. You guys get 80% of cash flow, 80% of the upside. Um, we're not working for the fees. We have fees, but you know, just like every other fund, we've got to keep the lights on. But primarily, I want my investors to create wealth. And um, you know, we can't do that if we're constantly like, okay, well, you know, here, there's nothing left. You know, um, you know, it's a little bit difficult. And my investors are excited about that. They're like, man, this actually works out better for us. So nice, nice. So tell me, uh, Victor, what are your long-term plans with with Bell Capital? I mean, it sounds like you have some momentum behind it. Yeah, I, it sounds it sounds like this thing is gonna this thing has legs. It's gonna grow. Absolutely. So my goal um, for Bell Capital is we need to get our first target is four thousand units. That'll put us at one point two billion dollars worth of real estate, um, and then we're gonna probably push up probably to about ten thousand doors. That's the that's the target. Um, at that point, we'll decide what we're going to do, whether we turn it into a REIT, our investors are going to stay in or not. Um, my MO has always been refinance, pay our capital, pay all the capital back to our investors and keep them in the deal, which is how I've done all my past deals. So it's easier to do that with the thought process behind it. We're going to keep investing. And then at some point, we'll switch over. I'll have bought enough multifamily properties and we'll switch over to buying uh, property management companies. That's the that's nice. The so, so, so right now, do you uh, use a third party to manage your, your properties? Like yes. property management? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So some of the bigger stuff we're looking at right now, we're going to be working with Graystar property management office. Um, you know, and then there's some other local ones around here too, that we've kind of, uh, we've approached them to say, Hey, if we get a deal that's below our buy bucks, but it's the right deal based on what's going on in the market, you know, because Graystar only deals with properties that are hundred units and above. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So earlier when you said that you want your, investors to stay in the deal what, what do. do you mean specifically like you I mean you don't want to sell the property you just refinance the property out but you keep the the property or what do you mean keep them in the deal mm-hmm. yeah that's what that's the i mean the first opportunity is always can we refinance all this capital out because we've executed raising the rents and things like that and then take our our initial investment and give all of our investors their capital back and just keep them in the asset and then they go and get in the same cash flow that they would normally get it doesn't lower their yep. amount and then later when we sell, you know, we'll double or triple whatever we had in it, which is what my track record, is, record has been. And then they're in the deal still, but they don't have any money in the deal or they can reinvest in another fund that we'll have open. But that's Got what it. I mean by keeping them in the deal. Got it. Yeah, it makes sense. All right. Um, moving a little bit onwards to a different topic, the books. Uh, I just want to congratulate you again, Victor. You are a uh, you're an Amazon number one bestseller. Um yeah. I see your books right behind you there. Um, maybe tell us a little bit more about them. Uh, which one was your first one and what what can people learn from your books? Sure. So um, the this one is my business book that I did. It was 30 Days of War. It was probably my first book. Um, I had some real estate stuff. I turned some things around. I used to also own a gym where we train MMA fighters, special forces candidates, um, wrestlers, things like that. You know, I was also a professional MMA fighter. Um, so this book is from that one. And then my apartment building book, I just kind of wanted to make sure to kind of express to people like, this is how I do it. So you have a better understanding. You know, everyone's not going to be able to invest right away. They're not going to be comfortable. This, and I'm explaining that. So the real estate book specifically, how we do it. This book is probably my game plan personally. 
when I realized after we sold one of our last apartment buildings, I was like, whoa, you know, I kind of had the identity loss. I've been doing it so long. And then made me realize like, you, you don't need more money. You need more cash flow. Right. And then once I kind of got that around my head, like my life picked up a little bit. So people were like, you know, what'd you do? Why'd you turn to this? So I was like, ah, here's what I'm doing right now. As of, you know, some people write books about what they did in the past. I like to kind of, it's more of a playbook for me. I'm like, here's what I'm doing. And if I'm doing it, I feel good about sharing information to like what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. But right now the apartment building book, um, you know, how to create wealth through investing in apartment buildings. I'm sorry. That's probably my main book. And, and, you know, I'd love to give them away. So if somebody wants to go online, they can, if that's all right, um, they can go to bell-capital.com slash book and they can download a free copy right there. Um, you know, I just, I, I love real estate. I think it's the best investment for people and I'm biased because I've never done, I haven't done stocks. I haven't done a bunch of other stuff. I've had other businesses and I like to, I, every time I talk to people that have a business, I was like, my real estate afforded me the opportunity to run a gym, to create a brand the way that I did. It wasn't the other way around. So, yeah. you know, that that's why like I'm, 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 I'm definitely bullish on the opportunity and be honest with you. Real estate investing is one of the top things that you can do. If you're going to invest your money in something, especially for me, I like real stuff. You know, like we talked about my wall. This is real, right? <laughs> so, right. So, so like when I think something real, I'm like, if I'm going to put my money someplace, I want to know it's there. I want to say, okay, like that's real for me. And is this going to create wealth for my kids, my grandkids? Because I have five grandchildren. Um, I want that for them. And that's the one thing that I know will be there in my absence. Those buildings will be around a lot longer than I will. So yeah, so with the books, you know, my kids can read it. They can be like, hey, this is what my dad did. This is why, um, this is how we think, you know, our training programs. But the thing that I'm most proud of is the fact that I made this switch to go from deal guy to starting a fund and really pressing forward with that and building a, building a, a, a wealth company that not just for my family anymore, that I can help other people because that's huge for me. Yeah. I really, I, that's, that's probably one of my bigger things. It's almost my friends would be like, man, Vic's always on us about investing in real estate. I'm like, dude, it's so important. I wish I had these opportunities when I was younger because I probably blew a lot of money. <laughs> that's okay, Victor. You, you did all right. You did all right from the sounds of it. But, you know, personally, I'm, I'm really big on real estate as well. Now, I dabble in other stuff. Like, you know, I, I play around in crypto and stocks and options and other stuff. But, um, the, the few rental properties that I own uh, or co-own uh, with my business partner, they've done really well over the last few years, you know, and mm -hmm. and uh, I always like real estate because when you're talking to somebody, like, there isn't that level of, what's the word I'm looking for, like, anxiety or, or fear as there as there is with other investments because everyone kind of, everyone has lived in a house before or everyone has lived in an apartment, like, people know mm -hmm. what you know, a toilet looks like or whatever. And so yeah. it's not, it's not that crazy. It's not like putting a hundred thousand dollars down on like coffee futures contract, you know, on the Chicago mercantile exchange. Well, what the heck is that? You know, like it's completely right. abstract. Real estate is not that abstract, right? It's something that is tangible. You can touch it. You, we interact with it daily. And so I always feel like that's a great investment for people to get into. It's somehow more intuitive and it's probably easier to wrap my head around than it is than, than some other stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm impressed by guys who can jump in. I got buddies who are like, that's all they do, like stocks and, and, and trade and cryptos and stuff. And I'm like, wow, man, that's awesome. You know, and then when we talk, you know, we talk about real estate because they're investors in my stuff too. Um, and they're like, yours is just, you, you know, like, you know what you're doing, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I know you do too. Like, but, but, you know, to your point, you know, there is the knowledge base that goes along with that and the real estate, you know, that's the biggest piece. It is real. If I give you an address, you can drive by, take a look at it. Find it on Google if you don't live around, you know, you know where your money is and, you know, it's, it's really hard to get rid of it. Like, hey, we still own that thing. Ten years running. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was I laugh. I was like, I know guys who've gotten divorced and their real estate's still there. Like, you know, their, their family was just like, we're not going to get rid of it. Um, you know, so so that's strong when I think about an investment opportunity. Um, so, but no, congratulations on that, man. I, I think that's awesome that you, you are able to do that. I, I haven't found that. And uh, I wish I would have learned that skill when I was younger as well to kind of be versed in those things too. And I think some of the the challenges, because I, I think more young people should get into real estate. I think the sooner people start, I mean, I think you were very fortunate to start in your mid twenties. Yeah. You know, for me, the light bulb didn't go off until my mid thirties. Right. And so right. that's when I started getting into real estate. Um, 
And actually, I did get into real estate in my late 20s, but it didn't go well. So I, I owned uh, two condos in the uh, Detroit area right mm. in 2008 when the uh, Detroit economy collapsed. Okay. And so I lost money on both. And so like I there's but you know, I could write a book about the lessons I learned uh, about right. those, but I kind of thought more about it and I waited about, you know, almost almost 10 years until I'm mid to late 30s right. and that's when I jumped back in and I'm really glad I did. But you know, the other thing about real estate is there's this like especially young people, I find that young people tend to gravitate, you know, toward the Wall Street bets crowd on Reddit or options mm -hmm. because they believe they can get rich quick. Right. And when you talk to somebody about real estate, you have to tell them, it's like, no, no, this is not a get rich quick scheme. You can't get rich quick with real estate. You get rich slow, right? That's what right. Um, bigger pockets always say. It's like, get rich slow. And young people right. are like, I don't want to get rich slow. I want to get rich quick, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I didn't either. Like I, I, you know, the weird part about it, and thanks for sharing that. I didn't really understand that I had been a multimillionaire for so long, but I didn't know it. You know, because again, there's a difference between, you know, money in your account and then your net worth, right? Um, so like, you know, it wasn't until someone older than me goes, well, you know, you're a multimillionaire, so you understand. And I was like, no, no way. And they're like, dude, you own like 40 properties. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I mean, but, you know, okay. And, and, and he pointed it out. He's like, you probably made, because you know, I closed a couple of deals and we had, we're doing lunch. And he was like, you made more money than everyone sitting in this room. But I hadn't grasped the concept. So to your point, yeah, like I, I, I kept... Which, you know, I still did some single family stuff and and I'm not a rehab guy, so I don't do fixer uppers. So a lot of the deals I do are like pretty houses. I do a lot of I would, the subject to stuff is the whole side side was just my personal. So, you know, I had money, but I didn't really grasp the concept of what you're saying before. Like, oh, wait, it's not fast money. It's, you know, this money, but it's this whole gambit, um, you know. So, yeah, so I have. The bet stuff, <laughs> you know, like like when I was younger, it was like that's I called it house hustling. I was like, hey, if I need, I won't do a house unless I can get rid of it by a Friday. Um, it's got to be nice, and that's how I made my fast money. But I didn't realize a lot of my holdings that I had was actually my net worth, and that's what you know people were kind of grading me off of how much assets I had, not what I had turned and burned and, and, and all of my fast money. So um, that actually hurt me to, to to have a bunch of money sitting around. My attorney it's says absolutely. that. Yeah. He's like, if yeah. you got money, you're not a real estate guy. I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> and I, it's funny. A lot of real estate investors say that, right? Is that the whole millionaire status just creeps up on them and they're not aware because I think that's one of the, the benefits of real estate is most of your wealth is locked up in equity, right? Yeah. And so you can't, it's not like going to an ATM. You can't just like take out a bunch of money and blow it, right? It's right. like, you're almost forced to save. It's like, as I have all this equity, it's growing, it's compounding, and I can't touch it, which means even if I want to buy a fancy car or a fancy watch, whatever, it's like, I can't because yeah. I don't have access to the money, which is the best thing for a 25, 30-year-old person. It's like, you don't don't you don't want to be near the cash because you're going to blow it. You're going to part it away. And it's like, no, no, right. real estate helps you save money, helps you keep you away from your cash as, it, as it's growing for you. So that's why I think real estate is great for that. For sure. That's what always made me jealous of my friends who had like other like fast money businesses and they were selling stuff. And I was like, Man, that's a cool car. How'd you get that? You know, I had nice stuff too, but it was just like, oh, I got this. I'm like, dude, I can't do that, man. <laughs> like, like I had like, you know, this happened. I got this. I got this deal in the works. You know, blah blah blah. But you know, it. it you're absolutely right about that for sure. Like, it, it forces you to look at things very differently if you're going to do a full time. So, Victor, um, as we move toward wrapping up this uh, this this podcast, I see that you're wearing the t-shirt. Right, you need more cash flow. Right, which I love. <laughs> um, and I think one of the other sort of words of wisdom that you always have is wealth is your duty. Tell us a little yeah. bit more about what you mean by that. Wealth is your duty. Yeah. Wealth, you know, uh, the last, when I, when I started the whole, you need more cash flow thing, I was like, you know, I, I didn't really picture me having a bunch of multifamily deals as wealth, right? It was like, Hey, I got a partner, you know, I'm raising money. I got to pay my investors. I got to pay my debt. When we sell these things or refinance, we're going to make a bunch of money and blah, blah, blah. But as of late, when I was like, all right, when we sold our last few apartment buildings, we moved here, I started looking at bigger deals. I started really looking at like, all right, Victor, like my goal, even when I was younger, was always to build a big real estate company. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know how I was going to get four or 5,000, 10,000 units, even though I would look at people do it. I started studying companies who was doing this and they all had funds. They were all syndicators. And I was like, oh, wow. But their conversation about what they were doing was different. They were dealing with capital, not money. They were dealing with wealth, not rich. And I was like, I had it backwards. Had I known what I know, I would have never sold anything. 
And then now I can actually make wealth a duty of mine. It's not, it's not anyone else's duty but mine to make sure that when we leave this place, I've created wealth for my family and I just chose, you know, real estate as a vehicle to do that. Multifamily apartments. Um, and if I approach it like a duty, it will be just like brushing my teeth. Like there's no way we won't make this happen. Um, and I think a lot of people, they don't approach it like that. Um, you know, I have another saying too: investors invest, you know, a lot of people talk about investing and never get around to it. Um, then something happens in their life and then they're like, oh, we have this, but it's not enough. And I'm always like, hey, you know, that's buyers buy, sellers sell, investors invest. Those are just baseline actions. Um, and the same thing, if you're going to be an investor and investors invest, make wealth a duty of yours and you will, you, you'll have it. It'll, it'll, it'll be something that becomes natural for you. So that's how I approach it, um, you know, from now on. So I don't know if anybody that resonates with people, but, you know, if you make wealth a duty, you will have it for yourself and your family. So, well said, well said. All right, Victor, what's the best way people can get a hold of you? Uh, sure. You know what? Uh, you can go to bell-capital.com. That's our site. You can schedule a call or you can, you know, click get started and, um, you know, kind of check out our investor portal. Uh, if You know, you got to be accredited and all that other stuff to take advantage of the fund. Um, or like I tell everybody, um, you can call me. I'm a phone guy. Um, you know, if it's not me, it'll be somebody in my office. You can call 808-778-1326. I've had that number for 20 years. Um, and, uh, another way is you can go to bell-capital.com slash book, and you can download our apartment building book. And, um, if you have any questions, reach out to me. I'm easy to get a hold of. Um, somebody on my team can answer any questions and I love talking to people. I love helping because people have helped me. So, uh, so yeah, so all those ways. And thank you so much for having me on your show. Like I've checked out some of your other shows. I listened to them. They're great. You're great. You're a great interviewer. I'm probably not the greatest interviewee, <laughs> um, you know, because I, I I love talking real estate, so I I I, um, I I I enjoy it. So thank you so much for what you're doing, offering this information to people so they have access to it. Man, if I had what you're doing earlier, I'd be much further along. So thank you for that. Yeah, thanks very much, Victor. And really, the, this show is all about the guests, and I'm I'm grateful that you were willing to take the time and share your story. And I will put all that information in the show notes about your website the the books etc and uh victor thanks very much and have a great day thank you i really appreciate you thank you have a great day